Uh, as I understand your contribution, one of the main uh, points is uh, the question of, let's say, self-naming God, or the sovereignty of God naming himself, that he reveals himself as a mercy in relationship, and he reveals himself for us. Uh, so the main point I would like to concentrate on uh, is the question of how God reveals himself in the third uh, chapter of um, Exodus, verse 14, asher I am who I am. And first of all, I would like to concentrate on several alternative translations of this text because I think it could be interesting for, for the for discussion and so on. Uh, so as Professor Soskis mentioned, uh, the, one of the famous text translations, the classical one is uh, ego sum qui sum or ego eimiho on. And the point was, if this translation uh, leads us to some metaphysical understanding of the text, I think it's not really necessary, but that it tends to this direction, and I would like to show two alternatives of understanding of this translation. Uh, first of them, I would like to concentrate on Master Eckhart's interpretation of this version, Ego Sum Qui Sum. The Eckhart's interpretation uh, is based on uh, concerning each, each word. Uh, first of them, Ego, says Eckhart, uh, means that God is based on his own grounds, Ego. He chooses absolute sovereignty, absolute otherness. Let us say. And then the second word, uh, I am, sum, is otherwise a sign of, of the purification of God, of God in that meaning that it has no attributes, says Eckhart. Its name without attributes is just verb, just being, nothing more, nothing else. And the last one, ego sum, qui sum, I am who I am, says Eckhart. Eckhart that's such a sign of relationship. But a specific one, this qui means, according to Eckhart, that it's uh, God's relation to himself, to God's self, but through the word which he has created and which he loves. That is a self-relation through the word. I think it's a very interesting translation itself, and it also shows show us some points uh, very well connected with your, your paper and your, uh, your interpretation. On the other hand, uh, there are some interpretations of this Latin translation, namely by uh, Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, and so on. And I understand that it doesn't uh, have to be a necessary metaphysical understanding of God. But with the, with the problem of this translation, it mostly concentrates on the being. It means that the way uh, how we discuss about God, how we think about God, is primarily, primarily about being. God is someone or is something. And the being itself becomes uh, the, the, the most important point of view in the relationship. Not what God does, how does he relate to us, but what he is. And I think it could be the danger of this translation. Uh, but mostly I would like to, uh, to concern on two alternative translations. First of them, of medieval Jewish rabbi Rashi, and then of contemporary Irish philosopher Richard Carney. So talking about Rashi, his uh, translation, translated into English, is I shall be what I shall be. I shall be what I shall be. And Rashi's uh, commentator says that the main motive of this translation is mission. God sends man to the world with some duty, but he also promises him that he will be with him, he will stay with him. He doesn't leave him alone. What Rashi accents here is the relationship and then the dynamical character of God's name and impossibility to, to grasp it, to define it. I shall be what I shall be. Here God refuses to be manipulated by his own name. Let us see in a very similar way. Um, French uh, theologian André Lacocque suggests that we can also use translation I am as I shall show myself. I am as I shall show myself. Uh, Karni's alternative, alternative uh, Karni of this text from Exodus, uh, is a famous quotation, I am who may be. I am who may be. What does it mean, this, uh, this very specific translation? 
original Kearney continues with tendencies of refusing God's name as something static, objective, and metaphysical. He wants to think of God in a dynamical, personal, and loving mood. His translation may be, there should be some middle way in between two extremes. Between, uh, between capturing the, the name too immanent, too human, and on the other hand, too transcendent, too unnameable. Uh, in this point of view, uh, God stays transcendent. I am who may be. It's up to me who I will be. It's above our notions and categories, but it still is uh, very near to us. We can risk to rely on Him if we can let God be God, says Kearney. God may be God if we let him be God. I think that these two alternatives can be a string for another, uh, another problems or questions uh, to, to Professor and to, to the contribution. So I would like to concentrate on it. Uh, first of all, if, if I would like to talk about Rashi's interpretation, I shall be what I shall be. Uh, I think that the main point is that this translation refuses any idols connected with God's name. I shall be what I shall be. That there is really a free space for God's self-revelation. Uh, God reveals himself as a promise, as a promise of God's future. God's acting freely, openly. It cannot be grasped as an object. But on the other hand, that's my question, it also seems to be more difficult to connect God's uh, self-revelation and self-naming giving his name to us people. Uh, because the future, the open future, the open future of God's love, God's acting, is anything what's not object at all, what's really open, what's very problematic to be named. Normally we, 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 we name things, objects and so on. So I think that in this translation, we, could strong, we can see a strong tension between the respect to the openness of God's future but the impossibility to name it. So my question is, if the self-revelation and self-naming of God is the same or not. How can we interpret it? Uh, on the one hand, I think that we can see it as a, as a interpretation when God is Deus Adventurus, the God who shall come, who can be manipulated, and who reveals himself as a promise. In this way, I think that we can understand it as, as an interpretation that's saving God's name. On the other hand, uh, the, the possible interpretation is, if it's impossible to connect God's self-revelation and God's self-naming, if there is any other way how God can reveal himself, or namely, if we can say that uh, God can reveal himself in different way than in language, for example, as we have seen some, uh, some pictures of, of the Moses and even on his sandals, isn't it also some other way of self-revealing God, let us say, with art, in music? If, if, we, if we think, for example, in music as a way of praying, silence, isn't it also a way where uh, God uh, can communicate with us, but can reveal himself without language but in silence? Or the third way uh, is the question if we could say that these ways of communicating could be also languages, let us say musical language, language of silence, and so on. And the last point, uh, it's connected with this, uh, this famous quotation from Exodus, is the question of uh, God's sovereignty. We are discussing that it's God's sovereignty of revealing. God reveals himself. We don't reveal God. And uh, Karen's translation, God who may be, I am who may be, uh, could be opposed in many ways to this interpretation. Uh, when Kearney says God is who may be, for him it means that God is dependent on us, as we are dependent as, a, as a, the people on God. If we let uh, God uh, be God, he can reveal himself in our lives, acting, love, and so on. If we don't let him reveal, he can't act as God. I think that we can see we can see many examples, uh, for example, from, from from spiritual life. If we don't pray, it's harder and harder to make make some place for God acting in our life. Or the, the big question 
of the theology after Auschwitz. One of the interpretations of Sopernis is that it was our duty to make place for God in this time. It's not God's fault that he couldn't act because he couldn't act in such a situation. Mm. So, uh, what I think that what's, uh, what's currently questioning, first of all, is the question of God independence. If God still is independent, if he reveals himself in relationship to us, or if, there is, if the dependence is from both, both sides. Uh, one small, uh, one small uh, point to the end, just as a footnote. I think it could be interesting, but we would have need uh, much more time to have a look at uh, Nicolas of Cusa, who was the Kernis main um, inspiring author, who also talks about men uh, like about the second creator. Cusa says the main point which connects God and man is the creation. Man is similar to God because man also creates, not ex nihilo like God, but still he uses words. For example, if, he, if, he would, uh, if, he, if I could uh, mention. Genesis chapter 2, what man does is the naming of other creatures. Hmm. It's also creating in some way. Well, I think it could be enough for now. Thank you very much.